Hello, it is a delight and an honor to be with you, to worship with you, even if it's virtually, and to speak to you today. I have tremendous respect and regard for Promised Land Covenant Church, for your leaders there, for your pastors, and especially for Pastor Mike. He is a friend and a mentor. Uh, I have the privilege of working with him at Redeemer City to City. He is my boss. Uh, I direct a program uh, under his leadership, and it is a thrill and a delight. Uh, and I'm so grateful for how God has raised up his prophetic voice in this prophetic moment. Uh, and when he asked if I would speak to you all, uh, I was humbled, um, especially when he said, here's, here's our series, here's what we're talking about. I thought, my goodness, I just want to sit and listen to you on this topic. Uh, but I'm honored to be with you and looking forward to getting into the scriptures with you today. Uh, our text today is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 56. Uh, it is part of this series that Pastor Mike started a few weeks ago, uh, Justice or Just Us. And uh, I am, as you can see, preaching in chapter 56, and I know that Pastor Mike has already preached parts of chapters 57 and 58. And when I told him I was thinking of doing 56, he said, hey, we're going backwards, praise the Lord. Uh, it's not my intention to, to go backwards, but I, when he said what this series was, the, the first passage that came to mind to preach was Isaiah 58. Uh, and I saw he was already covering that. And then the second passage that came to mind was this one, Isaiah 56. A few years, years ago at the church that I pastored on the Upper West Side, I preached through the whole book of Isaiah. Uh, it took a little over a year and a half. I, I chopped it up a bit. Uh, but I don't think that there was a single text or a single moment, I should say, in my adult life uh, where uh, a passage was more transformative and more illuminating. A passage that I, like, was studying to preach, it just like opened things up for me. And uh, I am eager to share it with you. So let me begin reading in verse 1, Isaiah chapter 56. This is what the Lord says, Maintain justice and do what is right, for my salvation is close at hand and my righteousness will soon be revealed. Blessed is the one who does this, the person who holds it fast, who keeps the Sabbath without desecrating it, and keeps their hands from doing any evil. Let no foreigner who is bound to the Lord say, The Lord will surely exclude me from his people. And let no eunuch complain, I am only a dry tree. For this is what the Lord says, To the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, and choose what pleases me, and hold fast to my covenant, to them I will give within my temple and its walls a memorial and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that will endure forever. And foreigners who bind themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord and to be his servants, all who keep the Sabbath without desecrating it and who hold, fa and who hold fast to my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain and give them joy in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar for my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. The Sovereign Lord declares, He who gathers the exiles of Israel, I will gather still others to them besides those already gathered. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now friends, when you come to the 56th chapter of Isaiah, you are entering a critical transition point in the book. Isaiah's prophecy is a message to the city of Jerusalem, and it is divided into three major sections. The first part is by far the largest. It covers the first 39 chapters. It has a five-chapter prologue, then in chapter 6 you've got that incredible vision that Isaiah has of the Lord seated on a throne, high and lifted up, and it transforms everything. And from chapter 7 on, you have God again and again making the point that no one will trust him and no one will obey him. Not the nations, and you've got chapter after chapter of God talking to the nations in there, but it's bookended by God's own people 
by stories about two of Jerusalem's kings, first Ahaz and then his son Hezekiah, these two. Ahaz in chapter 8 will not believe the Lord. And then after a great deliverance against the Assyrians in, in chapter uh, 37 and 38, it seems that Hezekiah will trust the Lord, but then in chapter 39, the wheels fall off. And he too, in that later portion of his life, refuses to trust God. And because of their persistence in relying on themselves, the people of Judah, the, the people of Jerusalem, would go into captivity at the hands of Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon. Well, that brings us to the second part of the book, chapters 40 through 55. If, if, if the first part of of the book is talking about God as the king of this city. In the second part, the, the, the focus shifts to the Lord as the servant of the city. And in those chapters, you see that God would not leave his people in captivity, but that he would redeem his people through the work of the servant. And that servant would be the one who would trust God and who would obey God and ultimately, as you know, if you're familiar with the book of Isaiah, as you know from Isaiah chapter 53, this servant would ultimately be the one who would suffer and die for his people. That beloved chapter 53 is the fourth of four songs about the servant in that slice of the book. Just in chapters 40 to 55, you've got four songs about the servant. And the fourth one in chapter, beginning at the end of chapter 52, verse 13, and going through chapter 53, it, it, it is the climax of the work of the servant in his uh, suffering, in his passion, in his death, and yes, at the end of chapter 53, his resurrection too. Because the servant would live again. He would see his offspring. And he would prolong his days. So you have the people persisting in unbelief, but God persisting in love and the servant redeeming them through his life and death and resurrection. And then you come to the end of that great section, chapters 40 to 55, in chapter 55, with this sweeping invitation to come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. And, and God just throws open the doors and says, everybody come to me, be satisfied with me, find your, your wholeness in me. He invites everyone to to enter into that everlasting covenant that God promised to David and that he executed in Jesus. And it looks forward to a world where the curse is reversed and all will be as it should be. And frankly, you get to the end of chapter 55 and you go, wow, what else needs to be said? I mean, in a word, what you've got in those first two sections of the book is the gospel, right? You've got, we fallen short, Jesus paid it all, so come. So you think, well, wouldn't chapter 55 be a good place to stop? Well, apparently not, <laughs> because there, here there are 11 more chapters. In fact, some people are convinced that the book should end at chapter 55, that these last chapters are not really authentic, that, that Isaiah didn't write them. In fact, some people say these three sections aren't just three sections. You have three different authors all together. You have Isaiah who wrote 39 chapters, and then a second Isaiah wrote the second part, and a third person wrote this section. And it's not so much because this section has a different style, but the content of this section is so different and some scholars say, well, you know, the book closes so nicely at chapter 55, someone added to it in these chapters. And to that I say, come on, man, you know, just because, just because you cannot imagine a single person writing, let's say, essays on medieval literature and also writing a best-selling defense of the Christian faith and let's say also writing and creating a fantasy world called Narnia, just because you can't envision one person doing all of that doesn't mean that C.S. Lewis didn't exist or that, didn't, that he didn't write all of those things. Now, you can believe what you want as to how many people wrote the book of Isaiah, but I wanna argue, however you look at that, that these chapters have a very important place in the book 
Because I would say the prophet is not done yet. He's not done yet with just issuing an invitation saying, come. Now think about it. He's declared God's glory, God's holiness. There's none like him. He's pointed out the failure of all people, the nations, Israel, Jerusalem, even Isaiah himself. Woe is me, for I am undone. He's warned of the coming judgment because of our sin. And then he announced God's great love and the hope that he extends to us through his servant's life, death, and resurrection. In in our terms, Isaiah has preached the gospel. And you say, that's it, right? We're redeemed. We're restored. We're forgiven. We're whole. And yes, praise God, that is all true. But the work of the gospel does not end at conversion. It does not end at the moment you believe. Because the work of the gospel is transformative. It shapes the way we live and act in the here and now. While we await all of God's promises to come to fruition. It reminds me of Paul's letter to the Romans. Though on a smaller scale than the book of Isaiah. You've got five chapters, and in those first five chapters, you have one section, chapters 1, 2, and 3, that pretty much talk about sin and how everyone has sinned. And then the end of chapter 3 through chapter 5, you you hear the gospel of God's great love through his servant Jesus. And so we're redeemed and restored and forgiven and whole. And you say, well, shouldn't the book end at chapter 5? Isn't it that like there's nothing else that needs to be said? And Paul's like, hold on. What shall we say? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may abound? By no means. The work of the gospel does not end at conversion. It begins at conversion in the believer's life. It's the same thing Isaiah is doing in these chapters. God rules as king, chapters 1 through 39. God came as the servant, chapters 40 to 55. But his work is not done because he will come as the conqueror. And that's how God is revealed in this last section. That's why I call it the conqueror and the city. For that final work of God, we his people wait. And while we wait, God is transforming us through this message about Jesus. And that transformation begins in the very first verse. Maintain justice and do what is right, for my salvation is close at hand and my righteousness will soon be revealed. Do you see God's logic in this statement? A lot of times Christians think this. They think, okay, second coming of Christ, someday God's going to come, he's going to reveal his righteousness, his justice is going to come. Well, that's, God's going to do that. And we're not God. We, like, he, he's God, we're not God. So we're just going to wait for him to do it. This world is so far beyond our ability to fix, it'll take God to make it right. So we're just going to sit back and let him do it. Or maybe we think something like this. Well, Jesus lived the life I failed to live, and now I'm accepted in him, so it doesn't matter how I live because I'm free. I'm forgiven. We take something that's true about God, that he will come again as conqueror to set the world right, that he has redeemed and forgiven us in Jesus. We take something true about God, and then we draw precisely the wrong conclusion. Let's let him do it. It's not our job. We're free. But do you see God's logic? He reverses the way we think. He says, it's precisely because my righteousness, my justice will soon be revealed that we are to work for justice now. And so often, that's exactly the way that God presents his prophetic message to us. He tells us, do this now based on something that's coming in the future. Like John the Baptist saying, repent now for the kingdom of heaven is coming. It's the future event. That doesn't justify us doing nothing. The future event compels us to do something now. But then to show just how serious God is about the way we live, he adds a stunning benediction. He says, blessed is the one who does this. I love that word blessed. It's one of my favorite words in the Hebrew Bible. Uh, The the Hebrew word is ashrei. We named our fourth daughter ashreya because of this word. It means happy or fortunate. Uh, The best definition I ever heard of that word is, it's what the world would call lucky. That's what this word means. I like to think of it as God's way of describing the good life. Who is so happy? Who's fortunate? Who's blessed? 
He says the one who does this, the one who holds it fast, not just a moment of decision, as one commentator puts it, but a, a living perseverance. And there's, two ev- there's a twofold evidence of this kind of perseverance. It's a person who keeps the Sabbath and keeps their hands from doing evil. As you'll see in these chapters, the Sabbath comes up over and over again as a mark of, of the transformed character in God's people. And if you think about it, you'll see why. It's not about laws and rules and regulations. It's not about Moses. It goes before Moses. It goes back to creation itself. When God rested on the seventh day, he didn't rest because he was tired or worn out. He rested to set a pattern for us, a rhythm of work and rest, of activity and enjoyment, of labor and renewal. So when God told Moses, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy, it wasn't meant as an enforcement of these are all the things you may do and you must not do those things. It was meant as a gift to human beings created in the image of God. You cannot work 24-7. You were not made for labor. You were made to know and enjoy God and the life that he's given. So he says, stop one day in seven and I'll take care of you. And that's where I would say you you see why it comes up so much in these chapters. Sabbath is a, there's no better practical way to show that you trust God for everything in life than to stop working. Like I trust God so much that I'm gonna cut my workload by one seventh. It's evidence that you really believe. And when you pair that with this other statement, you're keeping your hands from doing evil, that, that means you're living your life in keeping with God's law. Law. So these two together, keeping the Sabbath and staying away from evil, are a way of saying, trust me and obey. <laughs> the very things that you weren't doing before the servant came, now you're blessed if you do. Now I say this benediction is stunning because in, in these two verses, it seems that Isaiah could potentially undo everything he said in the first 55 chapters. I mean, hasn't he driven home the point that nobody, not even God's people, could keep God's law? Hasn't he already shown us that we are inherently doubting people who don't trust him as we should? And hasn't he proclaimed that our blessings come through the servant who has pierced for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities? But this verse says you have to keep the Sabbath and avoid any evil. evil. Who then is blessed? Apparently no one, but not so fast. Again, God right, is right there to offer a corrective before we run too far in the wrong direction. Because in the very next verse, he says that real people are recipients of this blessing, and he picks the most unlikely people to prove just how far-reaching his grace is. The foreigner and the eunuch. Now friends, the foreigner uh, refers to someone outside of the family of Israel, not descended from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but who committed themselves to Israel's God. And the eunuch refers to someone who for one reason or another is incapable of having children. Maybe because they were in a royal position. Maybe because of a pagan ritual. Maybe because they were born that way. But both groups were on the margins of society. The foreigners were treated as second class, which is why they feared exclusion. And the eunuchs were looked down on because it was assumed that they must be under God's judgment. And they had no possibility of legacy. That's why they were tempted to say, I'm a dry tree. There's no legacy. There's no fruit from my life. And yet God promises blessing to these marginalized people. He answers the aching heart of the eunuch by promising a memorial and a name better than sons and daughters. You see, friends, in God's kingdom, children are not the primary marker of blessing. Being in God's family is the marker of blessing. Not having children, but being a child. Not producing offspring, but being an offspring of God. And he answers the fear of the foreigner by granting them access. He says, I'm going to bring you to my house of prayer. There's no need for them to fear exclusion or childlessness. The welcome is extended to foreigners in, the welcome that's extended to foreigners and eunuchs is not a concession, it's a fulfillment. 
This is what the Lord's house was always meant to be. That the people on the margins find a home and find joy and find welcome and a family. So that leaves us with a dilemma. On the one hand, the blessing is reserved for the one characterized by justice, who keeps on doing what's right, who keeps the Sabbath and avoids evil. And on the other hand, it's open to the most unlikely recipients, the eunuch and the foreigner. How do we resolve this dilemma? Well, friends, it's just as the answer is as simple as it is obvious. Verse 2 tells us, blessed is the one who does this. Can, can I nerd out for a second? Like, dude, you've been nerding out this whole time. Maybe. Let me, let me nerd out a little bit more. You know, everything in these verses, verse 1, is plural. Right? It, it's, it's ustedes, not usted. It, it's people. Everything in these verses is plural except this. This is the one. Who is the one? Well, friends, none other than the servant of the Lord. He's the only one who maintained justice. He's the only one who always does what is right. He's the only one who kept Sabbath without desecrating it. And he's the one who never failed to avoid evil. Friends, the one who lived the good life is Jesus. And his glory is put on display right here in verse 2. And when Isaiah uses that word, the one, it's actually a standalone word for a person emphasizing humanity in its weakness. He picked a word for Jesus to emphasize Jesus's ordinariness. I mean, that's mind blowing. We tend to think that the way to achieve justice is by attaining power, rise to the top and then maintain justice for everybody else. But this one went the other direction. He left the position of power. He stepped out of the portals of heaven and he took upon himself humanity in its weakness, in its ordinariness. And from all outward perspectives, he was just an ordinary, underwhelming human being. You say, that sounds sacrilegious to talk about Jesus that way. Look at the beginning of Isaiah 53 again. There is no beauty, no form, nothing that made us go, wow, look at him. And from that position of weakness, he maintained justice and did what is right and kept the Sabbath and kept his hands from doing evil. You say, well, when did he do that? Well, you don't need to look any farther than when he actually quoted Isaiah 56 in Luke chapter 19. When Jesus entered the temple courts, he began to drive out those who were selling. It is written, he said to them, my house will be a house of prayer, but you've made a, a den of robbers. The temple courts was the very place where the foreigners and eunuchs could come and worship, but the religious leaders turned it into a barnyard where the marginalized would be discouraged from worshiping. No wonder Jesus was indignant. You say, but if Jesus is the one, if he's the only one to live the good life, how can blessing come to the margins? How can it come to anybody? It's because when the religious leaders asked him for a sign of his authority, Jesus said, destroy this temple and I'll raise it again in three days. They thought he meant the the physical building, but the temple he's spoken of was his body. See, that's where in verse 5, he's not just pointing to, in Isaiah 56, 5, he's not just pointing, he's not just saying, to to the people on the margins, I'm going to hang up a plaque on a wall in a building. Like, your name's going to go right here. No. Their blessing, our hope, for us on the margins, what God does is he brings us into the temple. He brings us to Jesus, in Jesus. We are in him. That's why in these verses over and over and over again, you say these people who are bound to the Lord. God wraps our identity up with the King Jesus. And he delights for it to be that way. It, it's, it's, Isaiah is using uh, terminology that Paul will pick up on when he says over and over and over again in those epistles, in Christ, in Christ, in Christ, we are in union with Jesus. And it's a mystical union. It's a covenantal union. It is an eternal union. And by virtue of our union with Christ, we are welcome 
No matter how far on the margins you are, you are welcome. You are part of the still others. Goodness, 2,700 years ago when this prophecy was written, God had you on his mind. You are part of those orange words on the screen. Still others. He brings you in to Jesus. You say, goodness, that sounds too good to be true. Well, if you want proof, look no further than the record of early church history that someone like you on the margins can find a home. I love this from Barry Danilak. He puts it this way. It seems more than coincidental that among the very first accounts of Gentiles coming to Christian faith, we have an account of the Ethiopian eunuch, a man who fits the description of both the foreigner and the eunuch described in Isaiah 56. You want to talk about someone on the margins? Here, this African man came to the temple to worship only to find out that he was excluded because he was a eunuch. And he's reading Isaiah 53 when Philip finds him and he comes to faith in Jesus and he enters into the blessings of the new covenant. Friends, his story proves the point of Isaiah. No matter how far on the margins you feel, no matter how separated from God you think you are, and in fact may be, in Jesus, God welcomes you home. God welcomes you home. And when you come home, you find that this gospel is transformative. Your union with Christ means you increasingly bear his image. And in this passage, Jesus is transforming the way we think and the way we act in at least four ways. It actually addresses four pretty controversial issues that we face today. First of all, quite clearly, this passage is saying, pursue justice, believer. Pursue justice. I know it's hard and it's tiring and it's exhausting. That's why you need to draw from the vine. You know that image of the vine and the branches? This, this is part of that mystical union we have with Christ. Like we need to draw on him to, to bear fruit. Apart from him, we can do nothing. But in him and because of him, we don't sit around and do nothing. We pursue what his, his goals. We pursue justice. Some Christians argue justice is not our concern, evangelism is. Yes, evangelism is our concern, but that is not the opposite. Why are we putting evangelism and justice as opposites? Only in the last hundred years in America have we come up with a way to separate these two. Friends, as Christians, we must continue to speak up for the people on the margins. We must continue to seek the welfare of the least of these. We pursue justice precisely because we know one day God's justice will be revealed. Second, prioritize the Sabbath. You say, well, wait a second, isn't that an Old Testament thing? No, friends, it's a creation thing. The purpose of the Sabbath is not to give you rules about what you may do and what you may not do. It's about setting aside time to rest and worship, to enjoy what God has given you, to stop trying to advance things and just enjoy what he's given you and to show your trust of God by saying I've done enough you say I, I can't like my job won't let me take a whole day off and I get it this is not I'm not trying to give you a legalistic rule I mean even in the New Testament obviously like the 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 gospel ran just flourished uh, in the the slave and indentured servant class and they didn't have the freedom to just take a day off a week but friends, the principle is still operative. And I would encourage you to prioritize Sabbath. You can't just keep doing more. Third, defend immigrants. Friends, we've got to think through this issue as Christians first, not as Americans first. How does God look at this situation? How is God's heart for the marginalized reflected in the way we talk about other human beings? It's easy for Americans to have the same kind of condescending attitude that God warned Israel about. 
friends, we on one level you could say, yeah, you know, we we need to defend immigrants because. Uh, except for the native populations, the indigenous populations, we're all immigrants. And at one level, that's true. But friends, we've got to go way beyond. We're, we're believers in Jesus. God has reached out to us on the margins and given us a home. We don't approach this just as an American where people have been transformed by God and by God's grace are showing what God is like by our actions. And finally, friends, and this too might be controversial, we've got a dethroned family. In our defense of Christian teaching on the family, we must never treat marriage as the ideal Christian life. And we do this in churches. I mean, I haven't, I haven't been to your church. I've, so I, I don't know if this is true in your church, but we do this in churches when we say things like, boy, she's such a great girl. I wonder why she isn't married. We must never treat marriage as the ideal Christian life and treat the unmarried as somehow second class. It's so common amongst churches in America and it ought not be. Unmarried people are often marginalized in churches like ours. Friends, marriage and children are wonderful blessings. I'm married and have five kids, but that is not the blessing of the new covenant. The blessing of the new covenant is that we're one with Jesus. And in Jesus, I'm one with everyone else who's in Jesus. We share that blessing together. Friends, in Jesus and because of Jesus, we pursue justice and we do what is right. Because that great day is coming when Jesus will return and will set all things right. And friends, by his spirit, he is at work in us, transforming us, making us ambassadors for his kingdom to show people now what justice will look like one day. So friends, by his grace and for his glory, let's go in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit.